What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have David Hernandez of Lotus823.com. And David, I always like to talk about other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And, um, you know, since this is about hashtag agency life and what you've done to build the company over the past over decade, um, check out the episodes. I did two episodes with Jason Swank. Um, shout out to him and his group. That's how actually how we met. And, um, you know, one of them, he talks about how, what they're looking for in acquiring agencies. And the other one is how he built up his over eight figure agency and sold it. And um, Todd Tasky is another good one. He talks about when you are going to sell your agency, what do does private equity look for and, and kind of the private equity r- uh, route. And he has the second bite podcast. So some of the people he's worked with make more on the second bite. Than they do on the first when the private equity sells, which is kind of cool. And then a D Clevett, um, that this is one of my favorite episodes because she, she, we talk about how to save hundreds of hours a month using top productivity tools. And I love productivity stuff. And we geek out on all the tools and software we both use on that episode. She also has a podcast. Uh, you can go to bizsuccesscg.com uh, slash podcast. That's B-I-Z success. CG, check that episode out. It's one of my favorites. I go back and listen to it, David, because I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that tool. I should start using that one. So check that out and many, many more. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We're an easy button to help you launch and run your podcast. We are accountability. We are strategy. We are execution. You know, David, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and the companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. So including David and his wife and Lotus 823. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. You know, without further ado, we have David Hernandez. He's co-founder of Lotus 823 with his wife, Allison. They're an integrated communications and digital marketing agency working with some of the most innovative and recognizable brands in consumer tech, lifestyle, and home. I mean, I went to your website, David, and I see a bunch of, you know, brands (laughs) that I recognize that I even use and I even own, including Audio-Technica and many others. And uh, in addition to that, He's a husband and father to three boys. That's right. And he was even a professional touring and recording musician. He's got a great TED Talk. You should check it out. Hopefully, we'll link it in the notes so you can listen to that. And David, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. That was a so great... <laughs> start off by telling people a little bit about Lotus 823 and, and what you do. Sure. So... Uh, the, the genesis of our agency was really built on the idea 12 years ago in our dining room, <laughs> Alice and my wife and I, uh, thinking about what was happening with social media at the time. There was this thing called Facebook that brands were still figuring out. Uh, you know, the the iPhone sort of brought the, your, you know, your digital life to a mobile place now. And these platforms, uh, in fact, I think when we started Instagram, wasn't a thing yet. It hadn't, it hadn't been created, uh, let alone TikTok or anything else. But we just saw that the consumers were going to be communicating with each other and with brands in lots of different places. It's, it wasn't just going to be top-down marketing anymore. Um, and that really was the genesis of building an agency from the ground up that was in its DNA, um, an integrated agency, both public relations, communications, and digital marketing. So we could really bring nearly full service um, practice to our to our clients and and really be a partner to their business goals. That really started twelve years ago in the dining room with a bunch of post-it notes on the wall, and you know, <laughs> it was the equivalent of, "Hey, yeah, let's go put on a play. I can get a curtain. Can you get some duct tape?" <laughs> that that's really, uh, and it was. Uh, us really just putting our shoulder into it, and we got one client, then two, then three, and and here we are. 
What's been the evolution? Uh, we'll talk about client wise, mm -hmm. um, the types of clients that you were working with then, and then the types of clients that are ideal ideal for you now. Yeah, that, that's a that's really a, a, an incisive question. When you start, it's you're just trying to get off your knees. You're you're trying to breathe life into this thing, and uh, it's you got a logo maybe, and maybe you got a one page website. You don't have case studies. All you have is basically your word as you speak to these folks and your reputation maybe that that preceded you in other businesses. And I did have sales and marketing in my background for, for many years prior to starting the agency. Uh, but still, it was a leap of faith for some of these brands. So we started with a lot of innovative startup brands in the tech space that, that were willing to take a risk on Lotus A23 to deliver for them in terms of media placements and get them some credibility, third-party credibility through media reviews and spotlights, et cetera. So that's really where it started. And it was building on that, uh, making sure that everything that we did, we did it successfully for those brands. And if that took extra hours, if it took um, extra time, we, we just put in the time. A lot of times we weren't profitable. Um, and it was a lot of, uh, you know, you're, you're, building the plane as you're flying it. Um, and eventually you start to have a, a body of work that you can use to go after bigger brands um, and, and brands with some reputation behind them. And that's brought us to where we are, where we, we have now worked with uh, some of the biggest brands in, in uh, consumer that are in verticals that we are um, not only interested in, but have had significant, ex significant experience in. And that's obviously in things like audio, given my background in, in music and um, in the home and houseware space, because uh, several years ago, uh, we we did an acquisition of a home and housewares agency that specialized only in home and housewares as we saw the growing uh, push between cons uh, the technology side into the home and into people's kitchens specifically. Um, and we just felt that by buying this other agency would give us entree into that space. And, and it, it did do that. It was Rachel Littner and associates shout out to Rachel Littner, who uh, is now semi-retired, although she's still uh, very much like uh, uh, in spirit with our company and still, still joins us on, uh, you know, on many of our social outings, et cetera, and is still a voice uh, for, you know, for advice uh, due to her really deep experience in the space um, that really helped expand our footprint from being a bit more limited in just the consumer tech space to a much wider space that has allowed us to move into livestock. Yeah, you know, you said a couple of things I want to hit on, which is one is acquisition. So <laughs> I'd love to hear learnings from acquisition because, you know, I talk to a lot of people and so do you, and they're always toying this idea of acquiring another company. To expand, maybe to a niche market, maybe a niche service. What were some of the learnings for you in the acquisition? Uh, there was a lot because uh, uh, we knew just enough to be dangerous, and then once we were in it, we realized we didn't really know anything. And uh, it was, it was, uh, there was a lot of, you know, fail fast and learn. How did it come about in the beginning? Were you thinking we want to? acquire someone in the home and housewares, or did you just meet, um, you know, Rachel? How did it first come about? Right. So the genesis was we met um, as opposite sides to a client and they were handling, Rachel was handling the public relations side with her team and we were handling uh, social media, social media marketing. And we just hit it off. We uh, both from New Jersey we both love Bruce Springsteen. You know, we had we had lots of uh, overlaps, and uh, and and she and she's uh, just a. I wish you could meet her. She's just a, a person with a great spirit and a great personality, and it meshed really well with us, uh, just culturally. Um, and it kind of just I feel like it grew, grew organically. I don't know if she said it first, or I think she said it first, and 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 basically uh, we thought, well, wow, that would actually be a great move for us because it would allow us to really expand into that space and have the entree of having a true expert at the helm of that of that 
uh, initiative, right? Um, which she is, and she still is, and and she was for us uh, for a number of years, and um, it really helped establish us quickly. And it was a, a way to really accelerate that entrance, as opposed to us kind of just trying to break down that door by ourselves. Um, so, was there a lot of challenges? Yes. Were were we frustrated sometimes with things? Yes, because you're you're trying to meld two different cultures and. There's just a lot that you don't know until you know, you know. What were and a couple of those? You only know what you know. <laughs> and some of those key learnings, you know, obviously it sounds like it kind of happened naturally. It's kind of like dating. You would kind of work together before um, right. with a client. So you kind of knew each other's style and what your capabilities and capacity was. Um, and then, but when you go to merge, right? I guess I like compare it to marriage, right? Like when you move in together, you live together for a little bit. It's not the you're past the honeymoon phase, but what were some of the learnings or, or challenges that you're like, okay, going back, and if we were to acquire another company, we would do it this way. Right. So I think part of it is really digging in more to understanding their processes, working with clients, as opposed to just looking at the results and the clients. And the, basically, you're also buying a book of business. That's part of it as well. But not really digging into that, we didn't realize how different it was from our process in working with clients and how we measured profitability, for example, and how we measured um, generating results versus what, what retainers look like, et cetera. It was a series of finer points that we we kind of glossed over or didn't really pay attention to, um, which led to surprises. But uh, no ill will. No, there was no no ill intentions on anyone's part. It's really about a learning process because we'd never done it before. So that's what I would do differently in our next acquisition is to really look at that and go, okay, let's really understand how this agency works for top down. How do they work with clients? How do you know? How, what's their process look like? Everything from onboarding all the way through to execution. Um, all those fine reports are are critical so that you really understand what you're getting in terms of revenue versus profitability. And then, of course, is this a culture that we can really get our arms around and uh, have it fit in um, without too much pain into the culture that is Lotus 823? And David, you don't have to share exact numbers or anything, but I'm just curious from a multiple perspective, how did you figure out the valuation? So really, we looked at a couple of things. One is the book of business. The uh, the valuation was really built on what does that revenue look like, and what what uh, clients are also locked in as clients. Because you got to think about that part too. Once there is an acquisition, does that spook clients that don't have any long term contracts and don't even give it a chance? And say, oh no, you know, I'm out of here. You know, that's not that's not what I signed up for. So that that was sort of the you know the key indicator. They were a boutique agency like us as well, so a bit smaller than us. Um, so it was really about buy, buying that book of business and her expertise and her, if you will, her brand in the space um, as an as a subject matter expert for public relations with home and housewares. Um, and so that those those were kind of the key factors. Uh, we didn't really look at it from a from a, a multiple standpoint because it wasn't really an agency of that size, and it didn't I, I, they at the time didn't have um, that many brands that we felt were were signed on to long term contracts, um, which would I think kick in something like that. Um, but so in that in that sense, it made it a much simpler acquisition. Um, the challenges, as I mentioned to you, really came on the other side of of the details of how do you really incorporate this now into the way we work. I think about you know what was the expectation of involvement. It sounded like you know Rachel brought a, a large body of expertise and mm -hmm. thought leadership, and she knew the industry. And I can imagine someone selling. Some people want to stay. Some people like, I want to go retire on the beach. What was the expectation and plan for for Rachel? I know it sounds like she's still involved, but maybe not as much as she was in the beginning. Right. 
uh, it really was from the beginning we had to kind of lay out what does this look like in terms of Rachel's involvement and when does she, and when is it enough for her um because that was part of it too is that she she wanted to be able to capitalize on all the hard work that she did do building this agency and its reputation and and at some point be able to exit so that was talked about and um and we had a we didn't have a, a if i recall correctly a specific date or 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 year in mind but we did have a window of when that was going to happen and it, it 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 pretty much played out like that the the bonus that happened here is that rachel has become a you know a dear friend of ours and is a an advocate spokesperson and uh and again a, you know continuing voice of experience for our team and for us and uh it that that's like sort of the 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 unexpected pot at the end of the rainbow separate to the business transaction that took place yeah i like to understand a little bit more in detail about what you do and mm-hmm. i love to talk about um peerless um and i know you like i was going and doing research and if someone's watching the video they can yeah. see um i am on lotus823.com and i just clicked on their their uh, case study page here um and you see Audio Technica here. You see um, Bamboozle here. You yeah, see Robo Rock, right. uh, Mackie, and then Peerless. So, what what kind of how did you first start working with Peerless, and right where to so, go from there? So Peerless, our our partnership with Peerless is almost as long as the agency's life. They have been our client for over nine years. They are incredible, incredible partners uh, as far as clients. Um, I, you know, shout out to the the entire Peerless team, um, and they, and there there have been growth and changes within their team, but still, every, you know, everybody that we've worked with, including right to this day, just incredible, incredible people. Um, but I I, I want to talk about where Peerless sits. They're a B two B client, um, and that's something that we we haven't talked about yet. But we we do quite a bit of. B2B business, uh, especially on the PR side and on on the digital side. And they're specifically um, a company that does commercial installs with uh, commercial mounts, and they are in uh, the digital signage space. So think about when you drive through uh, your favorite fast food restaurant, uh, how do those signs, how are they visible to you in in bright light and, you know, with sunlight? Well, that requires commercial level signage. That's uh, something that uh, Peerless does. So a few years ago, we worked with them on uh, on on a specific strategy to help them reach out to very specific uh, verticals, including hospitality and the sports technology publications. And really, um, we had a, we just developed an incredible strategy. That our team and. It, our team really built that out and generated, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think it's uh, north of half a billion impressions on this particular camp. Oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so my memory is not that bad. Uh, and with 17 awards that were won by then. You were only off by 52 million. So yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 552 million. It's a drop in the bucket. Interest. There you go. Um, and, and as you can see there, you know, over 700, 700 stories, including the, you know, the Forbes hit. Um and it really helped elevate them into the digital signage space in those verticals that they wanted. Um, and for us, that was a huge, a huge win for us. And but of course, it's a huge win for us because it's a huge win for the client. Uh, all, all I can tell you is that um, uh, over those nine and a half years, every every year has been a, a really a rewarding year. For our team and and for their team working together as partners, um, it's really they're like part of the the Lotus family at this point, and um, we really, it's really this is a great example of how Lotus and, I, and this might be a good segue because you I think you were touching on this before um, how Lotus works and they're a, a perfect example along with a few others of us being a partner, not a vendor agency to the brand. And uh, there's a big for us. There's a big distinction in that because it really requires a level of uh, intimacy on the agency side and the agency team 
to treat the 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 client not as okay here's the services we signed on for and we're just going to go do that for you but really be able to evolve strategy evolve tactics based on what the client's business goals are and you could say well a lot of that has to do with sales but marketing is the support to sales pr supports that we're not responsible for sales directly obviously but it does have an impact that visibility that credibility that happens through through third party media outlets um and for us to be able to say that we've worked with a client for over 9 years uh there has to be that level of partnering with the brand and not just saying okay uh, you know we checked the boxes this month uh, on to the next yeah i'd love to hear how in the beginning i'm sure people come to you david and they're like hey we want this and then that expands once so like, oh, this this is well, what else could we do? What else could we do? So I'd love to hear what did Peerless start off with? And then how did the services you do with them evolve? And I could see they're doing some amazing things with screens and kiosks. And that must be exploding because I'm seeing more and more <laughs> kiosks everywhere, yeah. um, you know, in stores and restaurants. And um, so this is this is pretty cool type of technology and business. What what do the services start out as and then how did they expand? And that's that's a question that flows into lots of our client partners. Where we start is not necessarily where we are today. Um, and that's both expansion and contraction in services, depending on the needs of the brand at any given time. So uh, I don't remember the specifics. I believe we started with just the PR portion, and then that expanded into work in SEO for them into some uh, digital marketing techniques, even uh, website consulting. All of that was part of the arc of our relationship with them. Um, our focus right now is back again more on the, the PR side and support with PR for the various events like uh, digital signage uh, show that, that's held every year. They, they and Infocom and you know several others, several, several other shows, and their folk, as their focus has changed because of expansion in their products, that changes the strategy as well. Um, that's also typical of lots of other clients where we may have started, well, to give you an example with Audio Technical, we really started as their digital agency. Um, gosh, and I think that's 10 years ago. And with Audio Technica, we've done everything we've from the the digital side content creation seo all the way to where we are now where we're fully integrated with them as their as their agency partner and handle all of it including public relations for them um when they've launched products like in the gaming space for example um we were there to help usher them into that space and help them uh really gain a foothold as subject matter experts in the, in the space and working with influencers in the space um, and that helped really solidify them as a player in that space, as well as obviously their reputation in audio with headphones and microphones, et cetera, from the, in fact, the, uh, I think uh, my microphone today, shout out to Audio Technica, my, my podcast mic here is, uh, is an Audio Technica microphone. Um, well, I own three of their mics, actually. One of them you can't see off of the screen over there. So I, I do like their products as well. They're, they're an incredible brand and they, they have a very wide footprint. They go from ultra pro all the way to consumer. Their turntables are yeah. phenomenal. Um, in fact, that's a, a very big part of who they are now is, all, is also the business and turntables along with their pro audio um, you know, products and offerings. Yeah, people are always asking me, you know, what what mic should I get? I'm like, a USB mic is good and the Audio Technica, the ATR2100 is like a real nice simple right. mic that that <laughs> has lasted like one of them i think i've had one of them for like six years or something and you plug in the computer and it works perfectly so i and love it that's what you want in a product right yeah right? exactly especially if you use it for your work for your business you want to be able to plug it in and it just works what are some of the misconceptions with pr because sometimes i think at least in the pr conversation oh no you just launch this PR <laughs> campaign and then you're done. It's very short term. And what are some of the misconceptions? And I'm uh, sure you're, 
potential clients come to you and you kind of have to dispel some of these myths. Right. So there is an education process sometimes. Um, and I think to, to answer the first part, there's two, there's two big misconceptions. The first one is uh, the belief that we're going to bring you on for PR so we can get sales. And we have to educate the, the prospective client and saying, well, that's not really what PR is for. There's lots of other tools that we have and services that can help you with sales. But first and foremost, public relations is the best tool to create credibility, earned credibility for the brand. And that's not, that is something that no ad campaign, no digital marketing campaign, no social media campaign can do for you, which is establish third party objective credibility for the brand. That's first and foremost. And along with that comes visibility because when you're working with us and you're a consumer brand and we're getting you into top tier media outlets, your your views have gone now from whatever, a couple million that maybe you had when you met us or you, you know some more established brands have even had hundreds of millions and we're taking you now into billions of impressions in some cases. Um, one recent houseware brand uh, that we've worked with year over year, we gen they, they generate a lot of media on their own because they're a well-known name. However, with working with us, year over year, there, it was 1.6 billion more year over year working with us than the, than the previous year. Um, that type of visibility helps you break into the A word, which is awareness. And when you achieve brand awareness, now you're having a different conversation with your possible community, right? Your probable customers, stakeholders. It's very different than visibility. Now you're you're starting to become ubiquitous, like Audio Technica, where you're just people know the brand, and in many cases they already have an image of the brand in their mind. There's an emotional connection that's made with the brand. If, so if you're talking to a client, a potential client, and basically you're saying, "What's your goal here?" and they say something like sales, then you know, you may have different services that you will talk to them about as opposed to we really want to be top of mind. And then the PR part, which is the awareness and the and the credibility and visibility is really the best uh, tool for that. Correct. Uh, and we still may recommend some type of a PR campaign if they have no visibility in media, because it really does help. And, and it becomes assets. I mean, it's content at the end of the day. And if you have third-party content that you can leverage on your social channels for that brand, that's third-party objective reviews, especially when you're talking about something like a consumer technology product, everybody wants to, you know, you're, if you're spending $300 for uh, whatever the, the widget is, you want to be able to research the product and go, oh, okay, this, they have good reviews here. Oh, this, wow, they got a great review in Wired. That This is something I should check out. That helps the next piece, which is, okay, we're going to run some digital advertising across social platforms. We're, we're going to maybe run Google ads, whatever that looks like and whatever the uh, the entire strategy for the digital side looks like, it does get a lot of help if it's got a boost from PR. Yeah, I could see that if someone's thinking of getting a product. And nowadays, people do lots of research online. So that article may show up. I'm curious. Is it common for a company to come in and go, hey, we want to get in this publication? Or are they asking you, hey, what publications do you think we need to, to, to go in? Or maybe they even come to you and go, we want to be in the New York Times or something just because that's what they want. Maybe it doesn't serve their brand and you have to kind of educate right. them. What do they come to you with with their, I guess, asks sure. from so, that standpoint? From that standpoint, a lot, you know, a lot of brands. And rightfully so, we'll say that they want to be in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Of course, everybody wants to be in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal if you're a brand, because that's a lot of legitimacy. However, not in every case is that going to move the needle for that brand. It really depends on who their audience is and relevancy, right? So if it's, an, if it's a gaming product, will the Wall Street Journal help? Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe... It's a better fit for them through the tech outlets. Maybe it's a better fit working a, a, an influencer program in tandem with PR 
that targets very specific gamers that have great communities. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about mega influencers. I'm talking about nano micro influencers with highly engaged communities that are going to actually care that that influencer is wearing those headphones. Um, so that's a different transaction and a different strategy than say something that maybe is more of a lifestyle product that could benefit greatly from the Wall Street Journal or or a New York Times hit. But along with those those two very esteemed publications, there's many others, like I mentioned, whether it's a Wired or it's a CNET or what have you. There's a big ecosystem out there of media, especially digital media outlets that have great followings in very, in very specific areas. If you've got a Mac adjacent, Apple adjacent product, well, you want to be in those, in those outlets because the people that are looking in those outlets are reading those articles specifically because they use Macs or they use Apple products, things like that. How do influencer, I know you do influencer programs as well. How does that work? I could see that being huge for people because they already, like you said, have an audience that, that know, like, and trust them. They're recommending a product that they uh, are, you know, they're endorsing a product. How does that work with when you're working with the, the brand and the influencer? Sure. So, when we build out an influencer strategy program for a brand, we're looking for a couple of things. Number one, relevancy. It, it's not about the numbers. If if a client comes to us and they're they're you know they're talking about celebrities, we really try to redirect them and say, we're happy to do that for you if you really really believe that that's what you want. But let us tell you what we know works. And it it really is about relevant influencers with truly engaged communities that have a great reputation. Really, it's almost a subset of PR if you look at it. Uh, those influencers are being are are essentially trust agents to those communities, mm -hmm. and you want though that type of influencer, not an influencer that's that's holding up a product because they have three million followers, and you know that they're never going to use that product. That's not going to resonate for the brand. So we look for relevancy, and then we talk about our process, which is, is a two-pronged approach. We have our own database uh, that we've built over the years of thousands of influencers that we've had experiences with that we know are a good fit for X, Y, and Z verticals. And then we also use software as well to support that because there's always new influencers on the horizon, and we, we like to stay abreast of every change that's happening in, in that space. Um, but it's ultimately about relevancy and community first before we really uh, we we really launch anything if you don't have those two elements it's not going to be successful for the brand in the end the the content that's created by that influencer lives in perpetuity so you want it to be the right influencers that are representing your client and you want them to have the right type of communities that are relevant for your client David, I want to talk about the company itself for a second. And I know that you're big on, you know, what is your why? You really want to partner with companies. And I'd yeah. love for you, I know culture is very important to you. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to talk about how do you maintain culture and the things that you do as a company? So this is a, you know, this is a kind of a, a tricky question because when you ask that question, everybody says, oh, it's all about people. But really? Does, does everybody follow that? And we've really, really sincerely have tried to be a people first company. And the reason Allison and I chose that path is our undying belief that you will get great people, keep those great people, and they will do great work if they have a work environment, a work family, whatever you, a work team that is a balanced team. Balanced meaning that the culture of the company allows for the reality that each person is actually a human being and has a life outside of work. And that um, men mental stability and, and security is important. And that, that the overall health of the person, both emotionally and mentally, is important. Because that's how you get transformative work. When you have people that feel great about their work environment, and if you 
done the right job and hired great people, that means you have great teams because you, you, you have people that are genuinely happy to be working with each other. All of those things make our job as, uh, as managing partners much easier, much easier. There's a, a, a book that um, was, has been one of our go-to books for years, and it's called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And in that, he, he talks about if you find yourself managing someone too tightly, you've made the wrong hire. Or you, they may be the right hire, but they're in the wrong seat. But either way, <laughs> if you find yourself managing someone too tightly, something's wrong. You can't you 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 can't run a business like that and have the type of results that you want to have when you're when you're us at least and want to aspire to have the the type of brand clients that we have if you're running it and you're running and you're managing everyone tightly it just it it's you're going to have mediocre work so that that overriding why there drives everything else it drives the fact that we have flex schedules for everyone because we are respectful that everyone has lives. We are a hybrid company, meaning we have physical offices, but we don't force anyone to come into that physical office if they're not comfor comfortable coming to the office or for whatever other reasons. By the way, that's also created an advantage that allows us to have folks in different parts of the country, which is great. We have uh, team members now in Florida, as well as in Chicago and uh, in New York, because we're, we're New Jersey based. But what that allows is it, it allows our staff to really build their schedules in a way that allows them to do the things they need to do in their personal life. And then when they're focused on our on the Lotus work with their with our clients, they're all in. You can't you can't accomplish that um, in our minds in any other way other than treating people with respect, giving them that flexibility, and having that trust. When you give that trust, you get it back. Um, the other piece is we have unlimited pay time off. And again, that's a trust factor. That's a belief in the team, in our leadership, that it's going to be managed correctly and not abused. And frankly, with the pandemic, we have, we have switched everything in terms of our focus. We focus strictly on results now and not the amount of time that it takes you to do it. Because at the end of the day, it's the results that matter. It's the execution that matters. It's the these campaigns and these strategies that are effective that matter. So treating people like adults, giving them that flexibility, and then so having that support through the the various benefits like unlimited PTO, you know, having, you know, having health insurance, having a 401k, all of those things create an environment where people it's not just a job, you know, they feel tied to the company in some way, they feel tied to their teammates, they feel, they feel a connection with the work that they're doing. And it, it ties back to having a sense of identity, that you feel good about the place that you come to work to every day. Dave, I have one last question that reminds me of um, one of my favorite books uh, by Daniel Pink, Drive, which he, he kind of talks about those those factors of autonomy, mastery, purpose, and and what really people care about in in the workplace. So um, so thanks for sharing some of that. Last question, and before I you know ask it, I want to point people to Lotus eight twenty three dot com, L O T U S eight twenty three, the digits eight twenty three dot com. Check out more, learn more about David and his company um, and um, check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. Uh, David, last question is about, I know you are big on relationships and partnerships also and champions. I'd love for you to mention a couple, I know you mentioned Rachel, but some, yeah, you know, sure. champions and valuable partnerships for you over the years that allowed you to do the work that you do. Um, sure. I, you, you can't do this alone. You have to have, um, partnerships out there. You have to have a network that you can rely on. And for for me, um, besides our clients, like I know we talked about Peerless and our nine and a half year relationship. And you know, shout out to Nick Belcor and John Potts, who who are incredible, and Becky Khan, who runs the the global PR uh and and her team. Um, but beyond that, I've made relationships on the sales distribution rep side. Uh, because that also is an important element for our clients. So I have 
really great relationships and actual friendships with with, with folks like uh, David Rhodes over at the E.B. Carlson Group and um, Bob Mark Antonio at, at Levin Consulting um, and Johan Jacob over at Retailbound. These are all really great folks, really great guys. And and Mike Smart at Greenline Marketing, uh, another great guy that, that I've worked with over the years. And the reason I mention them is not only are they effective at what they do, but they share similar core values ab about their approach to business in terms of honesty and integrity and being respectful to the clients they work with and being able to say no, not just taking somebody on and taking their money if they don't believe that they can really help them. Uh, those things are important to us as well. Um, and again, many times we've worked on opposite sides for clients um, and that's how we met, but then we've nurtured our friendships, our relationships throughout the years. And uh, you know they've been invaluable in helping us in, in our success stories because they they do the that other very important piece, which is sales and distribution. Well, David, I'll be the first one to thank you. Check out lotus823.com. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.